I'm Rob Skinner, and this is the Rob Skinner Podcast. In this episode, I talk to Rubik and Fiona Galustians. They're disciples baptized in the 80s in London. They both worked secular jobs until 2020 when they were asked for the first time to go into the ministry and go on a mission to Glasgow, Scotland. They moved there at the beginning of the pandemic to strengthen the church and raise up native leaders to replace those who had left. In a little over two years, they doubled the 20-year-old church to nearly 40 members and raised up a full-time local couple to lead the church. Listen as they share their one-person-a-day motto that guided their leadership. The importance of finishing like you start. Three proverbs that have guided them to raise three kids who follow Christ. And the secret of doing ministry after working secular jobs. All this and more on the Rob Skinner Podcast. Welcome back to the Rob Skinner Podcast. My goal is to inspire you to live a no regrets life, make this life count, and multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. I hope you're having an amazing 2023 so far, and I want to invite you to the CLIMB Conference in Dallas, Texas, November 30th through December 3rd of 2023. I really want to persuade you to go to this conference and register. We're going to have some amazing speakers. It's going to be a great time to strengthen everyone who comes to this conference. It's a CLIMB Small Church Leadership Conference. And so if you're leading a small church, if you are in a small church, whether full-time or professional or self-supporting, this is the conference you definitely want to go to. If you're interested in missions, if you want to grow spiritually, you need to come because people throughout the country, throughout the world are going to be coming there to share their insights on what's helping them to grow during this time. It's going to be amazing. We've got Sean Wooten who's going to be speaking. We've got Dave Bliley from from New Zealand coming all the way from um, New Zealand there. And that's going to be an amazing time. Darren Overstreet's going to be talking about his book, Wildfire and Progressive Theology. And we're going to be having people from around the country and around the world come and share what's working for them during this time period, this challenging time period in the ministry. But what I'd like to ask you if you're listening to this is, who do you know who's growing their small church? Who do you want to listen to? Who would you like to hear at that CLIMB conference? If you know of somebody that you say, hey, Rob, you got to get this person to come and speak, definitely reach out to me at rob at robskinner.com. I'd like to hear from you. Also, I want to say thanks to to you because uh, through the podcast, we're able to find an amazing young couple to lead our campus ministry. I've talked about my ministry incubator program and a couple was, you know, thanks to a listener, they started listening to the Rob Skinner podcast and contacted us and we hired a great couple to uh, lead our campus ministry at the University of Arizona And that is Coleman and Alexa Gordon. And so they came out uh, last month and they seemed to like it. And they, we offered them a position. And so they're going to be taking over for Kevin and Erica Liu when the Lou's finish here at the end of the semester. And so they're moving out here in April, but I want to say thank you because you've been spreading the word. You've been talking to people, but I also want to let you know, we're still looking for people to plant churches around Tucson. There's still room. So if you, if you want to plant churches, if you want to grow, if you want to really learn how to do ministry and become a missionary planter, you definitely need to come. And so I want to talk to you specifically if you're older and you feel like you you want to serve God in some way. If you'd like to uh, plant a church, we have a lot of cities around Tucson that we're looking to to strengthen and to plant churches in, in our metropolitan area. In particular, there's a city called Sarita and Green Valley area just south of Tucson. And we've got an amazing retired um, 
woman who's a, a pr- chiropractor. Her name is Dr. Karen Kolarik, and she is just cranking, and she is just fired up and is, has formed the core for an amazing area. Now, Sarita is one of the fastest-growing cities in in Arizona. It's just an exploding suburb, and then Green Valley is more of a retirement area. So it's a great combination of young families plus retirees. And so Karen is just going all, all out. She's she's bringing people to church. It's about a half an hour drive from her. It's not far, but it is a separate city away from Tucson. We'd like to get a church going there. And so if you are an empty nester, if you're a retiree, or if you're a person in your 30s or 40s, you go, man, I'd, I'd really like to lead a small church planting. Or if you'd like to support one financially, get a hold of me. This is exciting. We want to see our entire area saturated. We want to see Arizona reach. We want to see mission plantings go out. I mean, I just dream about the day when we've got a million disciples in our family of churches, not a hundred thousand, a million. That would be awesome. But it just starts with people going, I can do it. And I think today's program is going to be very inspiring for, for you. If you're thinking about, Hey, I think I could do ministry. You can do it because the couple I'm going to talk to Rubik and Fiona had secular jobs for all their career. And, um, now they're in their in their late 50s and 60s and they they went and led a church in the professional ministry for a couple of years and just did an amazing job and i know there's so many people who are listening right now you could do it you could do it so if you're interested in that get a hold of me rob at robskinner.com look forward to hearing from you rubik and fiona welcome to the program thank you thank you thank you Lovely it's good to be, to be here. here with you guys yeah, it's great. It's great to have you on the program. And you were recommended by other disciples, other leaders and said, you got to really talk to this couple. How did you guys become Christians? Well, um, honey, I'm going to let you answer that. Okay, first. since I'm slightly older. <laughs> yeah, so I was, I grew up in, in the sort of English Anglican church. Um, I'm South African born, uh, moved to the UK in 1984. Um, and I was just minding my own business one evening uh, and I was bumped into it by a young woman who invited me along to her local women's Bible talk group. Um, at that time, it was very much men's groups and women's groups. It wasn't so much of a you know united group. But anyway, uh, it was very engaging. I was surprised how interesting the talk was. It was very, uh, you know, it was, it was very engaging in terms of lots of questions and people answering interesting questions that they had about the Bible. And I guess my friend uh, became, well, she realized that I was quite interested to know more. Um, And so I started studying the Bible. Uh, I think probably for me, the most challenging part of that was studying discipleship because I'd known for a long time there was more to being a Christian than what I was doing. Um, So having sort of got over that hump, uh, the rest of the studies were relatively straightforward. And I was baptized in August of 1986 in the West of London. Oh, we got baptized the same year. Oh, right. Same age. Now, how old were you at the time you got baptized? I was 25. Okay, great. Terrific. Wow, that's awesome. And yeah. so at that time, that was, okay, 1986. Who was leading the church there in London when you were? Well, Douglas. Douglas and Joyce Arthur were okay. leading London okay. at that time. And they had the Douglas and Vicky Jacoby here as well. Got it. Okay, what an exciting time. That must have been so yeah. awesome. So the original team, you know, was still lurking around. So I was a product of the London Hope campaign. So two years running, they had in 1985 and 1986, they had these lots of Americans would come to England uh, and help do lots of reach out during the summer. And I think that's how I got met. Got it. Okay. Terrific. And Rubik? Yeah. And uh, actually, by the way, that was uh, Siobhan Dennett who met Fiona. Wow. Siobhan is in the Western counties now in, 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 in London. Well, outside of London on the West Coast. I was born in the Middle East. I'm Armenian by birth. Okay. So I was I was gonna ask you about your name because that's a very unusual name. I've never heard of Rubik Galustians. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's Armenian. I'm an Armenian background. Uh and Armenia has got his history, you know. Right, well, sure. The genocide, snake. everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but also first nation to accept Christianity. Right. As a, as a, you know, as a nation to accept Christianity. Uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, I was born in Middle East, 19, 1960. I'm 62 now. Uh, I'll be 63 in April. And uh, I came to England in 1987. 19, mm-hmm. So 1970, 19, 
1978. That's right. Thank you, honey. 1978. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't here, but I remember. <laughs> yeah. That's, sending... that's what's known as a suitable helper right there. She's... <laughs> <laughs> it was 1978, December. And, uh, yeah, and by 1986, uh, having been in the country for about seven or eight years, I had messed up my life big time. So uh, I've never read the Bible. I, I, even though I came from a Christian kind of background, right. I had never read the Bible. Uh, my mom and dad, they, they were not religious. We didn't go to church. I knew more about the Quran, Islamic, uh, the, 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 word, you know, the Quran, the writings, rather than about the scriptures. But the, something about Jesus always inspired me anyway. A man on the cross. That was just incredible. That uh... so anyway, cutting long story short, I was a serious gambler, as well as everything else. Wow! And in 1987, I prayed, God help me. Hmm. I need help. And uh, and I had a business. I had a laundromat where people do their washings. Right. And I saw somebody reading the Bible. Because it was my it was my laundry. I was walking around. I saw someone reading the Bible, and uh, and I just tapped on his shoulder. I said, "Do you understand what you're reading?" <laughs> that was my question to him, and and he said, "I do." I said, "Well, listen, I read the Bible, but I can't make head or tail of it." Wow! How is this person Jesus going to help me two thousand years later? Wow! What a question. And he said to me, well, I can help you. I said, well, uh, you know, I've got some faculties. You know, I can understand. If something makes sense, I'm prepared to change. So he said, uh, are you free to study the Bible with me? I said, yeah, you can come over this evening if you want. And I closed the shop at 6 o'clock and he came and I said, bring with me, bring with yourself the various translations of the Bible because I've heard there is many of them. So he brought the NIV, 1984 NIV, King James Version Bible, and a, and a message or something like that, paraphrased. Anyway, so we looked at one uh, seeking God, and, and I said to him, that's it, we need to stop now, because I can see that we don't need to look at one scripture in every, every book. It makes sense. It's just written differently. Right. We can continue with one book. And after doing Seeking God study, uh, I knew in my heart God was answering my prayer. Wow. And I had also fasted for a day just to say to God, I am serious about change. Wow. I, you know, I'm really serious. I, re I was 27, and we started the Bible seeking God. And I said to the, he said to me, what do you want to do? Do you want to continue on? I said, yes. But in my heart, I knew it was going to impact every part of my life everything i i was living an immoral life i was gambling i was tax evading i mean everything and then two weeks later having studied the bible for two weeks i went to everything i spent some time with doug arter and doug said what do you want to do i said i need 24 hours to really count the cost in my own in my for myself and, uh, and then uh, I contemplated uh, that, Lord, this is going to change everything. But if, if, if this is it, this is, this is it. I'm not going to turn back. Whatever rain, sunshine, good, bad, I'm going to get on this journey and never give up. So that was a decision I made. And it was 3rd of March, 1987, when I was baptized. And... Mm. Uh, that's it. So yeah, uh, that was my journey. I came to church, and I began to change all friendships, everything. Uh, I was a single guy gambling the whole time. So yeah, third of March, nineteen eighty-seven is when I became Christian. How did you let go of the gambling? I uh, I was very open, very honest uh, with a brother at the time who was mentoring me, Steve Allen, mm -hmm. Steve Arthur Allen. Uh, and uh, I just spoke to him da regularly, daily. I mean, 
to be on also that was gambling was a big thing but immorality immoral life was also up there mm-hmm. uh, and I and I and I thank God it was the last time I ever I was immoral now I don't want to boast about this I want to be very sensitive as I share this but I've never um personally or or uh, I've never been immoral in any other way I mean I don't want to use the word you know you can be personally very impure sure of course but uh but, but I've never done that wow since 1987 uh but before that it was a serious struggle in my life mm-hmm But uh, so the advice I got was every time you're tempted, just keep looking at the cross wow. in your head. And that, that really helped me. I find that so inspiring. I mean, that's the power of the gospel. I mean, when you really call people to repentance, there's just such a dramatic change. And that that's so inspiring. Now, how did you guys meet? You guys are converted right around the same time. You were, uh, Fiona, you were baptized August of 86. And then just six months later, Rubik, you were you were baptized. So how did you guys meet? Well, I can't actually, to be honest with you, remember the exact date, but I can remember the first obvious interaction was we were having one of our sort of invitation meetings and there was a whole crowd of people. <laughs> in the row in front of me was Rubik with all his mates. You know, it was like, who brought you? It was Rubik. <laughs> you know, so, and because Rubik owned this laundrette, it became the sort of meeting point for, you know, all the locals to find out about Christ. You know, Rubik had this, uh, this what was this verse you had on? Yeah, the, the wash wall. your scenes away. Yeah, wash, <laughs> you know, Rubik, Rubik wasn't hiding anything behind the washing, uh, the laundry. Anyhow, uh, so that was kind of when we first met and then we started I started going out on dates and, and what have you. And it was all a little bit intense initially, I think. So I think we were trying to figure out, it was probably late 87 when we started sort of taking an interest in each other. Um, and initially it was a little bit sort of probably a bit more intense on Rubik's side than it was on mine. Um, and Rubik will explain he had sort of desires for the ministry at that point, And I clearly didn't, you know, at that, t- at that stage. So he was advised to kind of put me to one side and look for someone else. So, um, I'm sure Rubik will pick up the story about what happened after that. <laughs> well, you know, we, uh, we met and, uh, and I thought Fiona was such an incredibly, uh, uh, well, she was beautiful and she is. <laughs> was. And uh, very polite, <laughs> very respectful. Oh. She's just an amazing woman. And, uh, and I thought, wow, I'd love to one day get to know this sister more. But that was after about a year. I mean, it wasn't an issue. But I did take the sisters out on dates quite mm-hmm. regularly. I thought, you know, it, it's something we got to do, encourage the sisters. And encourage myself as well in a big way. So we got, I got to know Fiona. Mm-hmm. And uh, I believe that I needed to go back to Middle East to, to serve the people there in my heart. So I was looking for someone who'd be eager to come with me and go back to Middle East, go back to Iran. Uh, but Mark Templer was very helpful. Mark Templer said, look, we're looking for people to go to Middle East who don't have many ties. Uh, and uh, it's it will be very challenging for you to be married, to go back to Middle East. Mm. But also by this time, thinking about Middle East was uh, kind of, uh, you know, I'm talking a little bit further down the line. I mean, uh, we, 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 you know, uh, by this time we are married uh, because we got married in 1989, December 89. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, and uh, so uh, Mark Templer was thinking of sending a team to Middle East, but it had to be the least amount of uh, responsibilities you had. It would have been helpful because the place was very dangerous. Okay, so let me ask a couple of questions. First of all, you initially you guys were going in two different directions and what what helped you rubik to to decide this is the woman for me um was there a turning point for you in in that relationship i think just uh, her commitment and her clarity of mind Mm -hmm. uh fiona is just very steady uh she she's i mean she's not your typical sister or a woman, <laughs> you know, because men could be men are quite 
go and get right sure i mean are more a bit more emotions a bit more feelings fiona's st stable kind of spirit is just been uh, a driving force and i must be honest i mean i'm from middle east so middle east uh i was looking for someone who was respectful mm -hmm. uh Again, I don't want to be boastful, but we've never said a bad word to each other. Wow. Okay. That's incredible. I mean, I, uh, Lord, how, how were we able to do this? It's amazing. I can't believe this. But it's now, Fiona, but, like yeah. you, did, when you were dating him, I mean, you must have thought, okay, this, this could lead me to the Middle East. This might be dangerous. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, you know, I didn't really know in that initially when, when we got we got together. Obviously, when the topics came up about, you know, we've all been called to go back to our homeland. And, of course, that's when the Middle East came up. I, I guess it was a bit of a surprise. But I think, you know, there were a lot of people going on mission teams around that time. You know, we mm. sent out India. Right. right. Um, and, you know, people were going Africa. all over the place. So it was all very exciting. And, you know, we're still in that early, late, late. Uh, 20s thing so I think everything was possible at that time I mean the truth of it was I I wasn't heart and soul for the ministry at that time so quite how that would have worked out if he had gone I don't know because it clearly would have involved the wife participating in the ministry in some way but I think we didn't think anything was at was was at risk in those days we just we just took a chance yeah um and obviously when it became more re when the reality was actually no you're probably not best to go you're married and um, you know, you need to probably stay here. Then I guess Rubik had to then deal with the disappointment right. um, of being asked to stay back. But, you know, there was always things to do in London, as, as we <laughs> subsequently oh, found out. Such an exciting yeah. time. Now, Ruben, Rubik, I'm sorry. You, okay, so you came from Armenia, but you'd mentioned Iran. Is your family from actually an Armenian family living in Iran? Yeah, they're Armenian descents. Okay. So we're actually Armenian kind of... You know, there would be the Armenian church and all of that. But I was born in Iran. Okay. Because Armenian people were quite diaspora. They were being all, you know. Got it. Scattered. Okay, so um, you speak Persian? Is that your native language? I speak Persian and I also speak Armenian, uh, which is different language completely. Okay. Uh, okay, so you were you born in Tehran? Where, where were you born in yeah. Iran? Born in Tehran, in the capital. Oh, yeah. my gosh. So they must have thought, hey, here's our ticket back to plant a church in, in Iran, in Tehran. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Okay, that's so interesting. Okay, so can you give a like an overview, a uh, 30,000-foot overview of your ministry career since you guys got married? Where have you, where have you guys been? Where have you served? Well, we got married. Uh, we, we became Christians in the west of London. Uh, we've stayed in London for, for all of our journey. Apart from in the last two years that we have, uh, we've, we went to Scotland. So we became disciples in the West London. Then in 2000, in 2000 we went to South London because we had our, our children were growing and we needed to be under kind of elders and in, in, get elders involved in our children's lives. And, and get our children to be close to uh, godly children, if, right. if that makes sense, because we want them to connect and, and grow with good, good, uh, good uh, mentors around them, good peers around them. So we moved to the uh, south side of London. And then from south side of London, uh, then 2003 happened. Then from 2003, we were asked to stay and to help in our where well the church went into you know six seven different uh regions right in, Can I over one night. yeah there. of course you yeah. have so rob it's probably best to make clear that all this time we were bible talk leaders uh serving as working on our own um you know secular jobs and, and serving the church obviously yeah um as bible talk leaders and family group leaders and so on so even the time when we were living in west london for about 10 years then we moved to the south side of london uh, for more support at that time, because we were not in the ministry, I went back to university and qualified as a midwife, um, mm. whilst my husband was running his own business. So we continued on that sort of secular vein, but supporting the church uh, through being leaders and then sort of group leaders of bigger groups um, yeah. until eventually Rubik became an elder in two thousand. Well, I uh, I started working part time oh, yeah, yeah. in the in the for the region. Mm -hmm. I did part time ministry. 
working for my business and also working three days a week for the church. Okay, so you were you were married in eighty nine, and then you kept the laun- laundromat or the laundrette. Yeah. And yeah. You, did you have a, a ser- like a franchise? Was this just one? No. Or- what happened was the no the laundromat was about for the next two or three years. After that, I worked for secular for companies. But companies were going down, changing policies. Eventually, I actually started my own business. I went into appliances, which is to do your, let's say, uh, the kitchen appliances, washing machines, cookers, dishwashers, dryers. I established a domestic appliance business that has been now running for nearly 30 years. Wow. So sales and service? of of Sales, service. uh, At its at its. And it's still operating. Wow. That business has done really well. I've never wanted to make a big business. I always want to have just enough <laughs> so we can pay our bills, <laughs> we can be comfortable, mm. uh, and we can also serve the church. That's mm. always been our motto. Wow. So at the heart of the business, I had probably, including us, about seven employees in, in the entire business. Mm. So, so having said that, uh, then I worked part time for the church. Then I did one year of uh, learning in Hebrew language. Wow! Because I was really just inspired by the just. Uh, I always thought the Bible, seventy five percent is in Hebrew Aramaic. Hmm. There must be a reason why God has chosen chosen the Hebrew language. And uh, so I was very fascinated. So I went to synagogue for a whole year, uh, learning the language, trying to connect with them, uh, which was great blessings. And then after that, I did also ministry training program, MTP, with, uh, with Doug Jacoby, going to Sweden, various places. Uh, yeah, so then after that, uh, Corey and Angela Stock came in 2012 to United Kingdom to serve and under their leadership we, I became a deacon and then four no, about five years ago now uh, I became an elder uh, yeah so that would have been around 20, 2019 when the pandemic hit United Kingdom as well across the world and UK we had two couples in uh, Scotland in Edinburgh and Glasgow American couples. So they left, uh, they had young children, they left back to America just before the pandemic. So the elders, one day in a retreat, I was there with my wife, with the the, the other elders. They asked, would I be prepared with Fiona to go to Scotland? and to serve there for a couple of years, two, three years, four years maximum, to strengthen the church in Scotland, and then also set up Scottish leadership, and then return. Uh, So at that time, Fiona had a really very, very good job with the nursing as a midwife, very high position in the NHS. My business was doing very well. So, so we decided that uh, we're gonna we're gonna go because it's gonna help our faith, and uh, to be honest, we took a, a financial hit because we had to rent our home for the first time, cut our salary, and the salary in, in the in the ministry, as you know, it's 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 good, but it's not what you can earn in the secular world. Sure. So. And God really blessed us because the, the Glasgow church really flourished. Uh, they've never been more than 25 disciples. The Glasgow church is 20 years old. Great church, by the way, but they've always baptized a lot of students mm-hmm. come and go through the transit. But when we were there for the last two years, we had, we had 13 baptisms across Glasgow and Edinburgh. And also a number of move-ins. So the church now, for the first time, they're over 38 or something in that number. Wow. They have a Scottish couple that leads the church. Wow. 
and they also are financially independent okay. whereas in the past they would have been supported by the uk uh, missions funds okay okay so there's a lot there. that's that's really exciting that i want to talk more about that so you guys were you're running your own business it's a successful um, startup that you that you built in appliances you're working as a midwife and then all of a sudden you get the call we'd like you to go and work in the full-time ministry so i'm assuming you turned your business over to somebody you you ran it through somebody else or did you sell your business well, I was hoping to sell it, but in the pandemic, who is going to buy a business? Right, there you go. Okay. That was so difficult. But God is always faithful. And on the last day, a disciple from the West region of London Church said, how about if I can help you to continue to run it while you're away? So for the last two years, the business has been kind of as a heartbeat, but it's there. So now I've returned to London. I'm out of the ministry with Fiona and my business is back up now running. And now we are back in the eldership in London and serving in London. Wow. What? Okay. That's inspiring. So you've spent your entire career in the secular world pretty much other than some, some part-time work here and there. And then all of a sudden you decide I'm going to do full-time ministry for the first time in your fifties. Yeah. <laughs> okay that okay so yeah. let's that's that's inspiring so you went up there in 2020 i'm assuming at the beginning of the yeah, pandemic November 2020 yeah okay so you go up there how, how did you do that like that's really inspiring the church nearly doubled after stagnating at a certain level for 20 years can you tell us what you do going into there how did you have the faith that said during the pandemic we can grow well, you know what? We went there, first of all, we wanted to connect with everyone because we, our son also served there a while back. So we had some relationships, but they were not very deep. We had a motto. I began to just initiate one person a day. One person a day. I talked about that a lot. That lets all of us really just encourage one person a day whether it's in the church or so, a neighbor, someone outside. And uh, we were very, by God's grace, we were quite effective with our ministry back in London. I mean, our neighbors becoming disciples, our work colleagues becoming disciples. Uh, that really was where the elders really took the initiative and said, why don't you go to Scotland and do the same? And see if you can encourage their faith can i add something there <laughs> i think um this meeting that my husband referred to where the elders were, were having a chat i think they'd got wind of the fact that i had suggested uh to my husband that we should support cardiff now our daughter and son-in-law had gone off to lead the church in cardiff in october of 2020 and me and my innocence you know cardiff is only three hours drive away i sort of said well you know, we could go and help them at weekends. <laughs> Little did I know that there was this need in Scotland. And so when the brothers had this meeting, that was when the idea for us to consider Glasgow came out of it. So inadvertently, instead of a three-hour drive to see our family, <laughs> we ended up putting eight hours without between ourselves and our grandchildren. But, you know, we said yes straight away. I don't think we hesitated even for a minute. Um, but I think from my perspective, I'd never wanted to be in the full-time ministry, Rob. To be honest, that was never my desire. I always wanted to be a Christian, um, do, do my career. And I think God did give me a great career, turning me to a new job at, at 41 is when I qualified as a midwife. So I've had a few career changes, uh, and that was a real big one uh, at age, age, age 41. So the thought of them giving that all up to go into the full-time ministry was just not even in my brain. But in 2020... I think God had put me into a job where I'd felt I'd achieved quite a lot. I was quite high up in the NHS in London and had felt that I could take a step back without any loss of loss of um, interest. Because I I thought, well, why can't I do the ministry part time? And I think that was mm -hmm. a new thing, even for the, for the churches here in England, to actually consider that people could do secular work and part time ministry and be as effective in both those roles. 
So there's only about four of us actually in the UK who have done such work doing part-time ministry and part-time NHS. And actually all of us are part-time NHS workers. So, NHS. Sorry, National Health Service. Sorry, we should explain. This it. is yeah for UK. So this is the, yeah. the UK National Health Service. So we've got um, dentist, uh, physiotherapist, and me as a midwife. So we're working part time, uh, sort of twenty or half time, with in our uh, secular work, and then doing ministry two or three days a week as well. So that was the deal, basically, that we would go to Scotland, Rubik would go full time, and I would work part time. That was also a solution in terms of the finances. Uh, for church because it meant the church wasn't paying the full work of two full-time ministers yeah, yeah. Um, but it also enabled me to keep my professional registration um, and see things from a different perspective working in a slightly different area of the country but also we were working together uh, which was also again new for us because we were now in lockdown thrown together in a house and <laughs> Scotland was very locked down very locked down yeah. I mean you couldn't cross county borders without being stopped by the police it was very strict so we didn't see church in real life for months. I mean, we never went into the city centre because you were literally just watching everything on Zoom, like we all yeah, know about yeah, that. Yeah. So, yeah, so that was my sort of entry into, into ministry from never having wanted to be in the ministry at all to actually being willing to not just do it here, but actually move 400 miles away because that's how far it is from our home where we are now. Um, and do it on a part-time basis in a new place. So that that was a real change. And only God could possibly have made that desire in my heart. Absolutely. Mm. Wow. Yeah, and we just basically did what we've been doing in London, you know, just reaching out to lots of people and building groups and motivating and encouraging and working. Yeah, I think people. I suppose on top of that, uh, very quick, we want to engage the church because the plan was to really build their faith. Yeah. And, and strengthen them so that they could baptize indigenous people, yeah. Scottish people who live there, not students only. I mean, there are great disciples up there in yeah. Scotland, all of them. But, you know, we sometimes we need the encouragement of one another. And, uh, and that was really our purpose, to go there, to strengthen, to build. Yeah, but I think we had great, oh, sorry, I was going to say we had good vision. I think the vision was that we yeah. would replace ourselves with Scottish leaders, and that was our goal and our remit. Okay, so let me just back up a little bit. So I should have asked this at the beginning. How many kids do you guys have? We have three children. Okay. Well, three grown ups. We have uh, Rebecca is our daughter that was born first. Rebecca, she's married to Zach Anton who's Ed Anton's son. So he came from Virginia. And uh, they've been married for about eight years, eight years or so. They've got, we have two grandchildren and they lead the Cardiff Church. In Wales. They've been leading the Cardiff Church for the last two years. Okay. So they will be going to America and then somebody else will take over from London. Got it. Then we have a son, Nicholas. Nicholas, he's serving in the ministry in Manchester, and he's married to Angelica. So it's Nicholas and Angelica. She's Blustis. Californian. She's from California. <laughs> yeah, we, we like Americans. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they serve alongside Chris and Teresa Broom. Okay. Chris and Teresa Broom. Mm -hmm. And then we have a third child daughter elizabeth galustians and elizabeth came with us to glasgow in 2020 and she's a disciple too but she has now remained back in glasgow wow okay so she left, a, left a deposit behind there you go so nicholas is is he in the ministry is he working at Okay, so he's yeah. in the ministry in Manchester, and then Elizabeth, is she a, a student or? Well, she's working. She's, she's working. Uh, working in Cape. Young professional. Yeah, she's a young professional, yeah. Okay. She's, she's not got desires for ministry at the moment, as far as we know. So. Got it. Okay, so you got three three kids, and they're all following God at this point. Yes. That must be so encouraging. Any tips on to, to parents of how to, how to raise godly kids? Uh, lots of patience. Don't be pushy. Um, trust God, keep the communication going. Yeah, I think yeah. be humble even with your be children. Humble, I mean, yeah. 
but be there in their lives. Yeah. Be engaged. Uh, I mean, I still speak to my son who's in the ministry every two days. Wow. And it's continuous. My daughter, which she would still, even though she's married, she would still call me and we still have a great communication. We still talk. Mm. We still pray together. We still engage. Uh, Elizabeth, my, my other daughter, she's again, she calls. She's in good contact. Uh, I think just uh, patience, patience. Uh, don't be quick to answer. Ask. I think there's uh, three proverbs. I'm going to give you three proverbs all in one chapter. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 17, is a really good proverb. It says, uh, one seems right until the next one comes and questions him. Mm. And then in the same chapter, Proverbs 18, verse 13, it says to speak quickly. It's, um, it, it's, it's, it's foolishness of the man. Don't. But then Proverbs 18, 15, it says the wise will seek knowledge which basically means ask questions, get to understand, engage, don't make quick assumptions. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I've been practicing, I've been studying the pro book of Proverbs last year and I'm trying to kind of connect how does this work and that helps, that helps. It's just a little thing. So it's, it's something you've used to kind of guide your parenting. <laughs> Yeah, just engaging with our children us, mm. because now they are adults uh, Rebecca is 30 Nicholas is 26 26, 27 uh, and Elizabeth is 23 they are, so they are young adults you know we want to connect with them and hear their views understand and give our you know our, uh, our encouragements That's and fantastic. then they can We'll support them. Yeah. Okay. So let's go back to this strengthening work that you did in Glasgow. That's, that's inspiring. Okay. Because there's a lot of people who are in their fifties and sixties who have years, decades of experience and are still passionate about Jesus working secular jobs, but wondering, maybe I should, maybe I could change the channel here and do ministry or, or serve or plant a church or do something like that. What advice would you give them? Because, you know, this is something I've talked about on the program before, is that there are so many people who are loaded with talent and experience, and they have so much to give, and their kids are out of the house now. They've got money uh, stored up. That, you know, they're, they're, doing, they're doing okay, probably have more money than they have had in their 30s and 40s. What advice would you give to a person who's considering going into, you know, maybe, maybe trying something, quote-unquote, risky, Mm. Any thoughts, honey? Mm. Well, I would definitely encourage them to have a think about it, but it's about taking responsible decisions. I think there are people who probably would be eager to help, but actually their background maybe make it more difficult for them to do that. So, yes, they would need to be financially capable and able of doing that. Um, there are risks involved. You do have to take a step back. In your professional life, you have to take a step back potentially in your earnings. Uh, so you definitely need to take care of all of the physical and the sort of the, the mechanical things. But I think a lot depends on how you've lived your life up until that point. Because I guess for us, we didn't do anything different in Glasgow to what we were already doing in London. Mm. So I think in any, any of these sort of um, roles that we take on, you, it's not something you go and start doing. It's you are doing it. You are being it you're kind of living it so i think my question would be to the, if that person is expressing a desire to do that i would kind of look at their lives or ask them so how have you been living your life thus far how effective are you you know do you have lots of good relationships are you good at motivating people are you good at teaching training can you study the bible with people because those are kind of the mechanics of ministry whether you are paid or not um so i i would sort of check out how someone feels about just living a life as a disciple. That's right. And then go and do that in this new place or in that area that needs help because right. you are exposed, uh, you know, and definitely we were exposed to things that we hadn't foreseen. Uh, but part, <laughs> of, 
God had been preparing us, but you know, you still get exposed and you have to be able to willing to take that on board, even if you're 60. Right. You know, because you're a bit older doesn't mean people don't tell you things. They're still <laughs> gonna say to your face, well, hang on a minute. So I think also you've got to exercise a bit of resilience wow. of spirit. Yeah. Um be be willing to accept that you're wrong, be humble. I think mm -hmm. humility and leadership is very important, compassion. So it's all those sort of qualities. I think one has to really question uh, anyone would say, how are you doing in these areas? Wow. If you're considering. That's, such gr a that's great advice. That's great advice. Rubik. Yeah. Just I think, honey, you, uh, that's great. I think, you know, I've been saying to the disciples uh, in Scotland, it's not how we start. Mm. Uh, it's how we finish, you know, uh, because, um, you know, I, I know uh, it's sometimes sad to say, you know, many of my early disciples, the, uh, many of my early uh, uh, companions in the journey, uh, they've taken a knock in their faith. Right. Mm. You know, I, stayed I, I think don't things. be discouraged right. wherever things are, wherever things are. God is greater than all of those. Things. That's right. God is, there's always hope. Yeah. So never give up on your hope. That's right. Uh, I think speak to those who are around you uh, and, and, and think of uh, finishing well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I think that was one of the big motivations for me. I thought to myself, you know, I'm living in a really nice place. We've got a very nice house. Everything is all set. We've got very good ministry here. But what is going to stretch my faith? What's mm -hmm. going to make me trust God more? Mm -hmm. uh, and with the help of those around you, I think you know, getting ad advice, many advisors make make you know make make the solution victory, sure. victory is short. That's I great. think get advice, get help, but be, be eager to finish well, finish That's faithfully. A, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. I think there's also the unseen benefits of doing something like this. I mean, we couldn't have foreseen learning mm. what we learned. And I think yeah, the perspective wow. of a small church, I'm so glad we've done it. Coming from a big ministry, and you will, I'm sure, be able to nod and say, yes, I know what that's like. Just seeing things through the eyes of a small group. There's no hiding. You know, everyone's involved. There's, if it's going wrong, it's going wrong for everybody. If it's going well, it's going well for everyone. Um, <laughs> And I think those are invaluable yeah. insights that we can now bring back to the bigger ministry. Right. Okay. So I, I really think it was very valuable to do so, that. So a question I have is like, why'd you come back? I mean, you're just cranking it. The church is doubles. I mean, my thought is like, why, why leave? They, they must have really been sad to see you go. Well, the truth is actually we've had some, we've had some conversations. They're like, <laughs> why are we going? Exactly. <laughs> well, we are going to support them. And it is amazing because when we sat in front of this couple and we said, would you be willing to go into the ministry? And, uh, and, and, and they burst into tears in front of us. They said, it's always been our dream to lead. Wow. Uh, and when we heard that, uh, that God was kind of fulfilling another dream here, we were so inspired that we could be part of that journey with them. Mm. And so we are going to support them. We are going to go every six months and build them, and the connections will be strong. Uh, but the truth is, I'm not Scottish. Fiona is not Scottish, and we have, we still have work here to be done. Uh, and uh, okay. so, and yeah, so so that was another journey. Okay, so you, you went there, obviously with a, a limited commission. Like, let's raise up new leaders, let's get the church growing, and and bring vitality back. And job well done. This got to feel great. I mean, that's got to feel good. Looking back, you go, know, our lives made a difference, especially during COVID, when many people just hunkered down and just basically marked time. Yeah, uh, you guys made a difference, and that's really awesome. Let's talk a little bit about how did you raise up this couple? I'm I'm assuming that it's a local native of Glasgow and how did, mm -hmm. what did you do specifically to raise up this couple And their names are Mike and Marie Jarvis. Okay. Mike and Marie Jarvis. Okay. Yeah. In fact, I've asked them if it's okay to pass their details to you so you can have a follow up maybe in a year's time or something. There you go. Just 
Yeah, just uh, if it's if that's okay with you as of well. Course. But uh, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> when we went there, we engaged with the church and also the couples who were leading the church. There were some changes we had to do uh, because some people needed to a bit more time to rest, just to recruit. Others were eager to come in and help. So we there were some changes. And we just earmarked that uh, who was working with us, who was alongside us. <clears throat> and it was certainly Mike and Marie that were definitely there. So we worked with them for about a year. And then after a year, uh, we sat down with them and we talked to them. Uh, Mike actually had a, his, he had a really good job where he has been working for 15 years or so, uh, product, production manager. Uh, so he had to actually give a notice for a whole year because mm. he had to replace himself. So it wasn't a quick turnaround. So uh, we did put it to him and to his wife, would they be willing? And as we planned the whole year, we planned for them to engage more. So in November of 2022, we stepped back so they could actually go on to leading the church on us supporting them from kind of the back seat. Uh, so we had a two months of transition period where they would be more engaged, they would be more planning, they would be more uh, visionary, more ideas, their thoughts. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, so. Uh, and they, are, they were encouraged and they were just the right people and we're still connecting with them regularly. Can Anything I add something? Add? Yeah. yeah, so in the run-up to that transition <clears throat> period, you know, we, we, we knew that they were eager to do it. So it was a matter, obviously, of making sure that the finances were in place to hire them, it, replacing us. So that was the other reason why we came back, because church finances didn't allow two couples on staff. And well, we could have stayed, but with my husband's business in London, it was a bit of a no-brainer really for us yeah, to come back yeah. but anyway so we you know we got regular time with them we very much led well I can speak perhaps for the women I, I see myself as an enabler so I rather than me kind of running and hanging on to someone and dragging them along with me I very much pushed them to the front and always worked from from behind but I mean and Marie really appreciated my putting her into the hot spot um, <clears throat> frequently during that sort of first year because they hadn't really They'd got so used to ministry staff doing the hard graft. And, it, you know, in many cases, rightly so. I'm not criticizing, but it, it just meant that the secular couples didn't get to do as much studying the Bible with people, didn't get to do the difficult conversations. Um, the discipling relationships were a little bit sort of, you know, superficial. So they were really thrust into the meat of the ministry with us there in support. So right from the outset, I did not rush in to lead all the studies. I said, right, well, let's talk about what we're going to do and how you think you should go about it. So I was present, but not people off, wouldn't always say Fiona's leading. They actually did what was saying right from the outset. Oh, Marie's leading. Got it. That's how it appeared. So we made yeah. sure it was clear where our vision was and how we were going to help them get there. And yeah, we stepped in where we needed to. Um, and there were some difficult conversations that we needed to lead on, obviously. But I think right from the outset, we set our hearts on, on being visionary and mm. we kept talking about the vision so that people very clearly knew what we were about. I mean, Rubik's one a day, start how you finish. I mean, if, if you speak to any of the people in the Scottish church, that's what they'll say, because that's what we spoke about so often. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And I think something yeah. else just to add, people, when they are engaged, they, they take more ownership. Yeah. I mean, right. even if, if, you, if Mike was here and you asked him a question like, uh, wherever he would ask me a question like what do we do about this situation my always my first question to him was what do you think right how do we how do you think we should go about this so he always felt engaged uh and and then i listen and him, then i would yeah. listen to him mm. and then if it made sense and if it was in the same way i'll say yes i concur with that if i had a different thought i would share it but then collectively as a leadership would decide how to go about it. That's so great. they were part of the group, even though we were in the ministry, right. if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So Rob, it's been a, I must be honest, it's been a bit of, it's been a highlight of our journey. And I'm so glad we did that because we learned so much. 
Right. Honestly. And I do take my hat off, I must be honest, to everyone who's in the ministry. Mm. I think uh, everyone who's in the ministry, they get a lot of encouragement, but they also get a lot of challenging situations. Right. So, you know, okay, so you're, let's go back a little bit to, you had a motto that you repeated over and over to people, which was encourage one person a day. Is that what it was? Yeah. One or person, one person a day. One person a day, whether it's in the church or whether it's your neighbor, whether it's the shopkeeper, whoever. So super, but, super simple, but outward focus. Like I'm going to, I'm going to help or serve or love or reach out to one person a day. I'm not just going to watch TV all day. I'm going to touch somebody's life somehow. That was it. One person a day. And and you just kept repeating that over and over again. I kept repeating it on, on I would say every, every uh, second or third message that I would preach, I would say that. So, what advice would you guys give to someone who wants to make this life count? Mm, that's a that's a really good question. I think, I think, as I said, you know, uh, we've got to find what is the what is the first challenge Jesus gave to the the, Ephes, the church in Ephesus. I think go back to your first love, and be open about it, and don't worry. I think do not worry about the answers, what people may say. Be open and express what is on your heart and, and uh, be eager to get the help because God will use people in your life to help you. Uh, God is there fighting for you. And don't worry. Finish well. Finish where your, your heart is like, am I giving all to God? Am I serving you may not be the person who says, I want to go and lead this church or serve there. But you may be able to be said, I can support it. Right. I can encourage them. Right. I can I can pick up a phone and call. Be part of the movement. Right. Part of the engagement. That's fantastic. And I think for me, it's just about surrender. I think if you surrender to God, then anything is possible. Mm. Uh, and if you want to, if you want to make your life count, just surrender to God's will, believe and put into practice what you read. I mean, it is just so simple. I think leadership is is great, but you know what? It's being a disciple makes you a leader just by, by following the truth. And I think trust God and then trust the people that God has put to lead because um, supporting leadership is really important. I think that's something we've really learned. And sometimes leadership doesn't always do the right thing, but be supportive and just speak up, but just surrender to God and God will make that count. Wow. Rubik yeah. and Fiona, thank you so much for your time. It's been great to talk to you. Such an inspiring story. I've really got some takeaways here. One person a day, finish as you started. That's fantastic. So thank you very much. Thanks, thank you, Rob. Thanks and it's been much. a joy to be with you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast, I'd like to ask your help. First of all, hit the subscribe button. Secondly, let people know about it. And third, read and review one of my books, either How to Plant and Grow a Church or Courage, How to Make This Life Count. You can find that on Amazon. You can also sign up for the CLIMB Conference. Definitely want to see you there. Please sign up at robskinner.com, robskinner.com, and there's registration right on there because my goal is to inspire you to make this life count, to live a no-regrets life, and multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. Have a great day and make this life count.